Home Away was sold to Expedia yeah. for three point nine billion. So we would went out and acquired all of the biggest vacation rental properties across the globe, France, Germany, uh, Brazil, Asia. We created the market for vacation rental. Uh, of course, Airbnb came in and disrupted us. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue. And now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results, economies, and cultures. There's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this, and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method many of us entrepreneurs in the internet and tech world are younger most of us are in our 20s and 30s because we grew up with computers and every now and then we get a guest on the show that's been involved with the tech and internet companies since before the dot-com boom and it is exciting to hear their stories because it seems like they have seen it all today's guest is Ross Burdorf and he is the founding CTO that worked with the global giant homeaway.com for 11 years until they sold to Expedia for three $3.9 billion. Ross was also involved with one of the first major search engines, Excite.com, that was once bigger than Google. Today, Ross and I chat about his time with Excite and HomeAway and what it was like building these companies to become the tech giants that they became. Later in the episode, Ross shares with us about how he sets goals and how he has used neuro-linguistic programming to help create the success that he has had. And lastly, Ross shares about his newest venture, Zen Business, that is helping entrepreneurs incorporate easily for a very low cost in any state of your choosing. Another exciting episode, guys, and without further ado, let's jump into the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, welcome to the show, and I'm excited to introduce Ross Burdorf and welcome him on the podcast. Ross, as you guys heard in the intro, um, was one of the executives and one of the people that took CTO, I believe, that took home away to three and sold it to Expedia for $3.9 billion. But he has a, a lot of fun tech stories to tell us because he's been in the scene for a long time and calling in from Austin, Texas. Ross is on the line. Ross, how are you today? I'm terrific, Chris, and I'm uh, humbled to be on your uh, podcast. I'm, I'm super excited uh, to, to visit today. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, quick question. We know there's a lot of entrepreneurs. We've had a lot of guests on the show that have that reside or move to Austin, Texas. I'm just curious, why, why did you choose Austin? Well, that's a great question uh, for me. So I grew up in the middle of the country in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I went to school for a little while in Lincoln, Nebraska, but it was pretty clear it was during one of the <clears throat> downturns. I think it was the savings and loan downturn. I don't, I don't know which one of them, but I, it was pretty clear I was going to starve to death in Lincoln, Nebraska at the time. <laughs> and so uh, my sister had graduated from school. She was in the banking business in uh, Lincoln and she moved to Austin. She said, hey, Ross, come down here, it's going on. And that was, you know, 30 years ago. And I got an internship at a, uh, a company that you guys will have to wiki called uh, Data General. So it was one of these uh, uh, mini computer companies. Data okay. General, uh, those were the companies that disrupted IBM. That's oh, wow. how, how uh, <laughs> old I am. Well, you were, we were talking before the show, and you've got quite a bit of experience in the tech world from way back when, which I, I'm excited to talk about. 
Um, but also I grew up outside of Kansas City, so just down the road from from Lincoln and I've been up to Lincoln a few times when I was younger. But uh yeah, I understand the desire or the move to a place like Austin. Well back then though, it wasn't the tech hub that it is today, right? No, it wasn't. I mean, that there was just a few uh companies um that that were here. Data General uh was one of them and uh there was a company called Tracor, uh, which did some military work, uh, and it was really just the, the beginnings of of uh, the the technology. IBM was a big employer here; it was just really the start. And I really, you know, the tech scene really came out of those uh, the, uh, early uh, companies and uh, the University of Texas putting out so many. That's where I grad graduated with a computer science degree. At UT is still considered in the top ten uh, CS. It still puts out a ton of uh, CS students. Wow! So, so that was I was always curious about this. That was the the boost to get all these tech companies because they had just so much tech talent down there, right? Yeah, and then I mean there was plenty of investment in uh, from government uh, down here to. Uh, to uh, uh you know get the scene going i'm trying to i'm drawing a blank on uh but there were a couple of um uh, uh industry um uh conglomerates that that came together with in associations it will come to me halfway through the recording and i'll bring okay. it but it's old history it's all it's all old history i think it's you know the university the great tech scene down here you know this is just a Austin's just a fantastic place to live. It's one of the youngest cities in the in the country. It made uh, the top list for starting up a business again this year in Inc. Magazine. Uh, I have started all my businesses here. It's just fantastic for talent. Really, uh, you know, this uh, uh, creative class um, that uh, it takes to to build the businesses that that we build these high tech startups. That's cool. So we know that you've been you've been in Austin for a long time. Um, what was the first business that you got involved in, the tech business in in Austin? Well, I, I did my internship at um, you know this is a good segue into maybe some other questions. I did my internship and I got residency so I could pay for the school because residency i think out if you weren't a resident it was like 250 dollars a credit hour if you were a resident it was four dollars a credit hour okay. so i got the residency working for data general interning uh doing software development and then uh i had this kind of early lesson in that the you know data general who was doing fantastic they did a billion dollars revenue and then six months later they had a downturn in the economy they were laying everybody off they closed down the plant and they kept me around one of the reasons they kept me around was i was productive but i was also cheap yeah and i i really had this early lesson chris that you know working for a big company wasn't this secure guaranteed future and you know that you know could have been a, a negative experience, but it was a it was a positive experience for me, which was you know it's it's better to be a, a, a freelancer, go out on your own. The risk is the same, and in a sense, you you have more control. You yeah. know, I I saw a lot of these you know career engineers with high salaries out competing, you know, with the a, a younger generation for. Uh, job, so you know, it moved me away from wanting to work at a big company. Yeah, that makes sense. And then after, how long did you stay with them until? Uh, you... Just for just just for a year. Then I went to uh, uh, Tandem Computers. Then, which was kind of a it was an internal startup. Tandem did the first fault tolerant machine. Uh -huh. Doesn't matter. Uh, then I went to Hal Computer Systems, which was kind of the last computer company built from the ground up. We sold that to uh, Fujitsu. Then I was at, at uh, 
uh, Excite.com, one of the early search engines. That was a great during the you know the the internet boom. I was all involved. I was involved in that in the Silicon Valley and Austin, uh, really all over the country. Excite had offices everywhere and did a lot of acquisitions. <clears throat> uh, and um, then I had a couple failed startups of my own, and I thought it was a great idea to do. Uh, uh, supply chain management software for the automotive industry, kind of the worst idea in mankind <laughs> but during, during the auto industry uh, bus. Uh, but then I came back and uh, after a couple of years of that, and that was really during the internet uh, bubble uh, bust. And then uh, came back and did HomeAway, founding CTO, early investor, did HomeAway, had a great you know, 11 year run there, raised uh, 450 plus million dollars IPO and uh, then sold it for 3.9 to Expedia. That's been a two years ago. I took a, tried to take a year off. I made it 10 months and then I started up a <laughs> founder and CEO of a, a company called Zen Business, which is our platform to, uh, provide small businesses with everything they need from formation, banking, insurance, accounting, taxes, domain names, e-commerce, kind of a one-stop platform for really an underserved market. We go after solopreneurs, entrepreneurs that uh, listen to uh, this, this podcast would, uh, would use our platform all in a digital platform. Everything's there in one, one place. I want to talk more about Home Away and definitely Zen Business, Zen business sure. throughout the show. But if we could go back to your time with Excite.com, because the, a lot of the people in the tech scene these days uh, didn't, I mean, if they live, they're, they're younger, right? They're in their 20s and 30s right. and 40s. So that if they, were, they, they weren't working when the Excite was around and there was a big uh, boom and a bust with the dot-com um, uh, economy and so I, I'm curious if you could talk about your experience with Excite for a while because for me that's exciting. I was in high school, you know, during that time, and then yeah, college and university. Yeah. And uh, what was it like going through that? Because I could imagine um, the that's the very start, really, of the internet and the tech world um, for for from what it is today, kind of like the birth of it. And you guys were kind of on the cusp or the, the, the front runners of this, how this world was changing and becoming, you know, more um, a smaller and globalized world through the Internet. And you guys were right there. And then you saw it like peak, 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 get huge and then they have its first bust. And I'm sure you guys had some highs and lows. So uh, what was it like for you? Yeah, I mean, it. it it was fun. I mean, I, if, if I want to say it was very exciting. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, no pun in, or pun intended. No, no, no pun intended. Both. It was, <laughs> it was super exciting. And, you know, when you're in it, you don't know you're, you're in it, but you, you, you know, you definitely uh, know something big is happening. I mean, um, you know, it just really took off. The, the, the infrastructure, of course, was already – you know, the, the groundwork had been laid out in Silicon Valley with, you know, Hewlett Packard and the, you know, the, the big computer manufacturers and, you know, Stanford and the university and just the infrastructure and all of the, the venture capital in the valley. So that all existed to support these kinds of uh, businesses that, that still go on today. Um, I mean, you have to give you the context. Steve uh, Case is an investor, you know, and uh, Rise of the Rest uh, Revolution is an investor in our company. And well, you got to put that into context. When I talked to Steve Case, Steve Case was, you know, the founder of AOL. Well, when Excite and Yahoo were in second place to AOL.com. Yeah. So, so, you know, AOL was the behemoth that really, uh, you know, started up the market and that was all with dial-up. At the time, AOL was an investor in Excite.com. So, 
you know, we did at the time Yahoo was a number two and Excite was a number three. Uh, Excite grew through acquisitions. They did a ton of acquisitions. They they went from you know uh, ninth or tenth place on search engine to third place in uh, search engine traffic, and they actually at the time we just did more and more acquisitions. So we would buy. Uh, 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 greetingcard.com, Blue Mountain, I mean, uh, Blue Mountain Arts, which was a, a, a greeting card company. We bought uh, 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 Web Shots, which was a screen saver company that's still out there. And, you know, at the time, two thirds of the internet traffic at one time at the peak went through a home away property. You know, they weren't all aggregated into one brand. I mean, into a, sorry, excite.com okay. property. Yeah. So, you know, we grew fast through acquisition. It was uh, super exciting. I mean, you know, hiring, we had all kinds of hijinks with uh, Yahoo. Uh, they had uh, they had uh, VW Bugs. I think they were yellow VW Bugs. And we had uh, Scooby-Doo's van was what uh, Excite had and they would steal our van or they would, you know, shaving cream it and we'd do all kinds of wacky stuff like that. <laughs> and then it was a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of growth. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, I mean, the, a lot of wealth created. Yeah. I mean, you know, options that were at $2.00 you know, ended up being worth $500. What do you think, Ross, was the the kind of tipping point where Yahoo and then Google took the market hold and then pushed out companies like Excite and, well, really kind of eventually pushed out Yahoo. Um, they're still around, but they just don't, they're just not Google. Um, what do you think it, it was that really... Um, help them to take the lead and push companies like Excite uh, out of the way? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, for me, I remember when uh, the Google founders came to Excite and said, hey, you know, we've got a better search engine technology, license it or buy it. And at the time, you know, it's a classic disruption thing. Uh, they went to Stanford, a lot of the founders at at Excite went to Stanford and they, you know, it wasn't like there was some hostile thing. It was like, geez, we, we think your technology is great. There's no way we can use it for our search technology because we've got, you know, uh, tens of millions plus invested in all of our technology, you know, to crawl the web and index everything. So we just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's a classic. What happened is that... <clears throat> You know, they had a better search, a better search experience uh, from a customer's point of view. It, it was, you know, they built a better mousetrap. And then, uh, you know, the real, uh, you know, tipping point for uh, Google, of course, was, you know, paid advertising and bidding, uh, you know, where they could really generate the commercialized that better search experience. And I think, you know, they've, they've stayed with it to make sure that they have a, a great search experience. Um, so disruption, that was a classic disruption. And it was, it affected everybody that, you know, they came on, of course, when the market, the bubble had bust and, you know, Google was headed in one direction and everybody else was headed in the other direction. Uh, Excite had made a, you know, had done a merger with At Home, which was a cable company, and you know, they everyone thought at that time it was, which was before, you know, I think it was before the market was there. You know, streaming content over cable lines at that time was a novelty. Now it's done everywhere, right? That's yeah. the. So that was kind of the beginning and end, and then we've seen what's happened to Yahoo. Um, you know, basically fire sold. Um, 
Well, let's move into your time at HomeAway. What, what year did you start with the company there? Oh, I think that was two. Don't quote. I'm bad with dates, but 2000. Um, that's been 11 years ago. So you tell me it's nah, be, 2008. 2007, actually. Yes, yeah, 11, 12, 13, 2005, six in that time frame. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, jumped in there. Uh, there were, you know, just a few employees. And uh, I think we'd done five acquisitions is how the company started. Uh, it's just been a series of, you know, 25 plus acquisitions um, uh, that we did. Um, I was the founding CTO, so I had to deal with all of those acquisitions, pulling all of the, the, the technology and companies together. And we would basically search in each market. I mean, the big innovation with HomeAway was we, we knew that there was this market for vacation rentals. And, you know, one of the, the leader in the U.S. was VRBO. Yeah. And, uh, you know, great experience. Uh, owners loved it. Uh, travelers would tolerate it. You know, it wasn't a great experience for travelers, but it was – the, you know, after you had stayed at the place, it was a great experience. You know, getting the place was tough, um, uh, you know, because it really wasn't focused so much on the traveler. Um, but you'd do it to, to get a, a, a vacation rentals, cheaper, better experience, the whole, the whole nine yards. And so we knew there was a market there. Our big innovation was, hey, this is a market. Travelers love this experience, what they've done it. We need to bring all of the inventory together across the globe, and we need to turn it into a, a great traveler experience um, so we can get the, that properties out in front of the traveler and, and, and make a better traveler experience. And that's what we did. So we would, went out and acquired all of the biggest uh, uh, vacation rental properties across the globe, France, Germany, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, you know, Asia, just in every country we'd go after the, the biggest one. And we got very good at acquiring and integrating the technology. Uh, so then we could present, you know, all of that inventory across the globe to the travelers. And that was really the innovation. We created the market, um, for vacation rental, of course, Airbnb came in, disrupted us in the urban market. It really wasn't something that uh, HomeAway did. Of course, we had listings in London and New York, um, but we were really focused on what the companies we bought were really vacation destinations. Right. You know, it was we created the market. Airbnb disrupted us. You you pick some really great companies to work with over the years. Did you do that on purpose or were you just lucky? No, I didn't on purpose. You know, Good. I was looking at your pre questions here. It's like, Hey Ross, how did you, you know, become an entrepreneur and you know, what are the kind of keys to success? And I had to think about that, not too hard, uh, but I, you know, and what I've got written down here is, you know, I think it's, Number one is goals. I mean, I told you about this first lesson was, you know, maybe there's some sense of, I think everyone wants some sense of security and, you know, how do they grow wealth and, and uh, you know, how do they get, uh, you know, break free of the day-to-day -day work. And, you know, for me, it was just a set of goals of what I wanted to do. And then, you know, after you establish those goals, you know, then it's execution on them. And really, I was thinking about, I, I really managed what I was, what my goals were, what I wanted to do financially, you know, uh, health wise, uh, you know, spiritually wise, you know, really managed it like a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a financial portfolio, I have other people manage my money because they're experts at it. But when you're managing your career, it's really good. to. I always looked at it as like a portfolio. 
it, you know, I've got some all, all great experiences, but I have two really bad failure companies and you know, I got out of those damn things as quick as I could. <laughs> right. When, when I could see, Ooh, that, that, this portfolio, you know, this is a, this was a bad bet. I've learned a lot. This has pushed my experience uh, forward, but you know, what's the next uh, opportunity to go to? Now, I wouldn't recommend, you know, jumping from company to company. I, I see that a lot. I think that's a bad, a bad move. I think you have to, you know, make a bet and then stick with it, uh, you know, until it's clear that it's going to be a failure and you're just wasting everybody's time. Yeah. But I managed it like a portfolio and then you really have to take action. You can't just, uh, you know, sit around. You, you, you have to jump into action and execution and show up, you know, ready to go and, uh, you know, leverage what you, what, you know, what you have to, the impact you can make at the company. What What were some of the clues for you to decide to join those companies? Ones that said, I think this is a winner. This is going to, uh, something that all, all I can work well with. And it, I know it's going somewhere. Yeah, let's see. Um, you know, I think it, it, it fundamentally for me, it, it was, you know, is the company in the right, I call it the right neighborhood. And so what I mean by that is, you know, the idea doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, some ideas are perfect. I will tell you the home away idea was perfect. That one was easy from the beginning. Uh, but is it in the right neighborhood? Is there a lot of, uh, you know, customers there? Is there a lot going on in this neighborhood? Does it look like a lot of opportunity? You, you could say that, you know, when mobile came out, you could say anything in mobile was in the right neighborhood. Yeah. You know, let's get into to, to, to mobile. Uh, you know, you, you know, you can say, uh, you know, I think uh, drones right now are going through the valley of discontent right now. So, you, you know, it seemed like I, I did a drone. Um, I was on the, the uh, uh, involved with a drone company. There's been a lot of failures in drones. Uh, I think it'll come back, but you know, it's, it's not this drones are not a macro level thing yet, you right. know, autonomous flight, but they will be, you know, so, so that's something to be involved in, in the, in the, the future. When uh, you came to excite.com, it was like, man, oh man, <laughs> you know, web portals, uh, search, you know, this is a major piece of property on the internet. That was, uh, definitely in the right neighborhood. Um, then with, uh, uh, home away, it was just, you know, immediately a super simple idea that was already working that just needed this innovation of pull it all together aggregate it and become, you know, the world's largest marketplace for vacation rentals. So, you know, and uh, everyone, I mean, who wouldn't want to work at a company where you create great dreams for families and groups of people, you know, that get to travel all across the globe. So it was a, it was a natural and you, I just knew from the beginning it was going to be a, a, a major hit. So you just, what well, makes sense and it's an easy description. And I think I'm not doing a plug for Zen business, but you know, Zen business has got all of the same trademarks. It's kind of, you, you know, uh, a business is a great idea in when you look at it in hindsight and you say, wow, that was a great idea. Why didn't I think of it? What yeah. a simple yeah. idea. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It, at, at first it might've been a, a little bit of a leap, in the vacation rental business, all of the companies that we bought, I would say the majority of them, I don't wanna say all, but the majority of them were vacation rental owners that created a web page for their business and their friends asked them, would you put up a web page for my, for my vacation rental also? <laughs> yeah. They literally started that way, uh, you know, on the kitchen table and in the, the 
corporate headquarters for HomeAway, we have a kitchen table. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know if it's still there. I think it probably still is. Where we had all of our company meetings was a kitchen table because all of the businesses that majority of them we bought were started over the kitchen table. So, okay. you know, it was a leap for those those people just kind of stumbled into the to the business. And then uh, I remember Dave Klaus from VRBO, uh, he told us when we bought him, and Dave's a great guy, he said, uh, Ross, I, I was going to quit my job when I was getting two paid customers a day. And yeah. that's, when he, that's when he quit his job, <laughs> was at two paid customers a day. I can imagine that's pretty satisfying hearing stories like that when people get oh, yeah. time, you know, ultimate time freedom because of something that you created. Yeah. Um, now you guys uh, were sold. Home Away was sold to Expedia, and uh, just I think twenty, just two or three years ago, for yeah. three point nine billion. Um, what was that experience like for you, Ross, going through? Uh, you know, you built. You were a founding CTO. You were eleven years with the company, building a baby up to a, um, a giant, which. It had influence all over the world. You know, you guys were all over the world, um, and then coming to the point of realizing you're gonna you're gonna sell, and then moving on to the next thing. What was what was what were the what was the experience like for that? Well, Chris, I can tell you it was is a fabulous experience because all of the executives exited except for the CEO. Okay. So you know, I mean. Uh, uh, Expedia paid a bunch of money for us, and um, uh, we left them a fantastic business uh, that you know is is has been a, a, a rock star performer for them. That's what we wanted to do, and at the same time, you know, we were all you know high tech founders, uh, and really it was time for all of us to move on. So. You know, from the beginning, the deal was set up of, okay, you guys buy it, bring in your folks to take it to the next level. We've got it to this level. And I think it was a, a perfect marriage for HomeAway's unique uh, entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, creating the VR marketplace and then, uh, you know, combining it with Expedia's brand and their ability to, you know, focus on traveler conversion was a uh, you know fantastic marriage so uh the brian sharples the ceo uh hung around through the transition for a year and then he left but everybody else exited um so there was no you know there was no i don't have any like oh horror stories you know <laughs> nothing like that i think it's, it's from what i hear everything went great and continues to go great so uh, I know when a lot of people exit um, their business, there's a, a vacuum of time that opens up. And some people, it's almost like losing a child or having um, you know a child go away to school. And they're like, oh, what's my purpose now? Did, did you have a similar experience to this? Um, I mean, I think it, it's, there was a little bit, I mean, in all honesty, there was a little bit of a, uh, uh, a shock like that when you've got so much, um, you know, of your value tied up in this thing that you've created and you have such great, uh, you know, growth and you hire, you know, everybody there, you, you know, you've hired or you, you, you know, so I think it is a little bit like giving up. Um, I wouldn't say a kid in our case, it was, a you know, a, a, a teenager and, you know, maybe a teenager that needed to be kicked out of the house, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe a college graduate when we sold it. So it was kind of time for us all to separate and hand it off to uh, somebody else, you know, to take it to that, to that next level. I mean, I think we, we all could have kept running the business and we're doing a, a great job. Um, at doing that, um, it's just after 11, you know, plus years, we were, I think, um, you get, you get pretty tired after that much, <laughs> that much growth. 
and yeah. you know you're really ready to complete that that cycle uh, that that we had done. So uh, I did take some time off. You know, after 11 years of working my butt off, I had to catch up on a bunch of stuff. I had, you know, I moved a house. I did, you know, all kinds of, you know, I went to the dentist and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, so, <laughs> you went to the dentist. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I caught up on uh, stuff like that, you know. Yeah. I said, you know, what happened to my kids? Where are they? Well, they've moved out, honey. So, you know, stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but... Uh, you know, we caught up on that stuff and then I didn't, I didn't last that long. It was 10 months. And then I started up this new, um, uh, company. I just, I'm one of these guys. I enjoy work. Uh, I like, I, my work is in balance. I'm not, you know, psychotic, uh, worker. I think, uh, you got to give value back to the world. The way I give value back to the world is, by starting up businesses that add value to the world, like yeah. Homeway and like what we're doing with Send Business. So I, I have a friend that recently exited his business and he is, you know, at ground zero thinking, oh, what's next? What do I do? What are some tips for other people that exit their business? Um, some tips you would say uh, for like, finding out what's next. Do you recommend some time off? Do you recommend them just searching on their own? Um, how to work for you and what, what would you suggest? Um, you know, uh, I'd recommend some time off. I mean, you just really need to cool down after, uh, you know, a run of over a decade. So, you know, I had some time to cool off enough time to where I got bored and, um, uh, you know, and had done all the projects I was going to do. And, you know, then I did spend some time thinking about what I wanted to do next. And, and, um, you know, and, and again, I really managed it like, um, I want to say I managed it like a portfolio. I think I said, you know, what do I want from my next career move? What, you know, do I want to do, um, you know, with a life balance and, you know, how do I want to contribute to the world? And, you know, that's why I ended up at, you know, Zen business. It's a full on venture backed, you know, hard running startup. Um, you know, but for me, my next move was, I, I mean, I had plenty of opportunity to be a CTO at any number of, you know, companies that are getting ready to typically for me, my next move would have been, Hey, go into another company that's going to have a, a exit getting ready to do a IPO because I've done that. I've done, you know, 26 plus acquisitions, literally had the hardest job at home away in dealing with all of this uh, technology and pulling it together. But I just thought, well, hell I've done that before. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I want to do that again. And it's like, this is really, really hard. It's really, really stressful. And, you know, you're constantly under the gun and, and making everybody unhappy, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, I, and I you don't know, want to take it to the next level for me, something I have done. So, you know, out on the risk curve is, you know, let's, can I be the CEO? And uh, so far, you know, my team hasn't fired me and they keep saying I'm doing a good job. So I'll take them at their word. Uh, I went out and raised a bunch of money for this business. Uh, we're doing great. And, you know, I'm having a great time. So, so far, so good. Um, you know, there's plenty of times when I think, what have I gotten into? But, you know, I thought that when I was the CTO at Homeway. So nothing's changed there. Uh, I just keep, you know, moving forward and, and taking the next, uh, making the next right move. So I think it's, you know, and, and again, I, you know, from, you know, my words of wisdom for what they're worth is, you know, the, what are your goals, you know, constantly be pushing yourself and, you know, to go after the risk because uh, you know, that's the, you know, how they make money in the 
in the financial arena is managing the risk and, uh, you know, get into action. And in my case, it was, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? And the worst thing that can happen is I can be, a, I knew I wasn't going to be a complete failure and I had a lot of experience. I could, you know, so if I'm just a, you know, a moderate success and so far it's been more than moderate, I'm going to gain all of this experience and, uh, you know, add a bunch of value to the world and, and, uh, you know, add some financial freedom to my employees and myself as we move forward. So, you know, that is really, I, I tell people to, what do they want and, you know, are they going to be pushing themselves? Yeah. When you, when you plan your goals or write out your goals, Ross, how do you, how it seems like you, you're pretty, um, you, you can measure these pretty well and, and you like to write these out. How, is there a system that you use? How do you, how do you, how do you handle that? You know, I, I, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff written about this. What I come to is, you know, really what it, it's, uh, what do I want? You know, what do I want to, uh, there's a, a process called the well-formed outcome. It's part of, uh, this thing called the uh, neuro linguistic programming. Yeah. So I really try to, what do you want to see, feel, hear, smell, touch, you know, in the future, and what do you have kind of direct control over, you, you know? So yeah. I've got direct control over, I want to, you know, uh, can put out a financial goal of, you know, how much money, but then you have to break it down and well, how do I do that? Well, the way I do that is by starting up a company, um, you know, in balance, you know, that comes out with, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to work for somebody else? You know, no, I don't want to work for somebody else other than investors. Everybody has a job and I'll soon I'll have a, a, a board, you know, a board that I work for. So everyone's got a boss. Um, but that was part of what I wanted was to, to push me on the, you know, what's the next step for me? Can I lead something like this? And so you can get really explicit. I kind of like to get down to, you know, what do I see here, feel, touch, and, you know, put it in the future. And it's amazing. And then I look at it on a, you know, uh, on at least a monthly basis of, you know, where am I, how have I made progress, what's not working. And it's, it's just there's some kind of magic to it in that, the, uh, I don't want to sound Pollyannic, but it seems like when you write stuff down and you have that in your head and you review it, you know, I also don't think my goals are like set in concrete. You know what I mean? If I put down a goal and then after 30 days I look at it, it's like, what the hell was I thinking? You know, this is a crazy <laughs> goal. You know, I must have been, you know, wild on caffeine or something. I, I'm okay to change them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And revise them and modify them. Uh, I think that, you know, the more you learn, the, the better you can make those. And the world seems to conspire for you or you conspire for yourself in that now all of a sudden you start paying attention to things that m might have been there the whole time. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Completely. So, yeah. And I think it's part of the, the whole action thing. If you, um, you know, I don't believe I'm in control of the universe. I feel like I'm just kind of flowing through it, but uh, I have to pay attention. And if I write things down that I want to pay attention to, then, um, you know, uh, more of that comes my way or I'll bump into more of that or, you know, I'll grab on to do more of that. Yeah, I, I, that's very well put. And I completely agree with you on all points, especially having that flexibility because, you know, say, say you have a goal to make, you know, sell uh, 500 homes in a year and then all of a sudden a recession hits and you're like, well, that's not going to happen. You know, you can't keep working towards that goal based on factors that you can't control. But um, 
I, I, I love the idea that you moved into uh, a business, Zen business, that I think is really cool because I was once an entrepreneur trying to figure out how to uh, set up my own LLC and just looking on the internet, these different options, and it was pretty confusing. And you guys kind of, it seems like you guys handle that for a very low entry fee, really. I think it's like 10 bucks a month, right? Well, so we, we do the formation, Chris, for free. For so free. There's really, yeah, we actually do the formation for free. Okay. And, and then the, the idea is, hey, we're tech guys. We should be able to tech guys and girls. We should be able to automate this process of formation and, you know, streamline it. So, and offer that for free and then sell other products that we know these uh, small businesses, these, these solopreneurs uh, start out single owner LLC, entrepreneurs, whether they're developers, pet sitters, plumbers, electricians, artists, whatever, real estate folks, um, they're going to need all these other services, uh, banking, insurance, accounting, tax prep, domain names, e-commerce, uh, social media, kind of everything, credit cards, lending, all these things that customers have told us that they want. It's not like we cook these things up. We, we asked them what they wanted. So we do formation for free, get you through the door, and then we have these uh, you know, services that you pay for on a monthly basis uh, that are all integrated into a single digital platform. And we have fantastic support. You can look at our reviews. We are fanatical about support. Uh, Zappos is an investor. Uh, so we're, we're, we're fanatical about support. We have high MPS numbers, 9.4. Uh, reviews out of 10 on Trustpilot. We really uh, are, are uh, coming through for an underserved market and pulling it all together. I mean, who, who wants to deal with all of this, all the things you need to have to get a business up and running? You should be focused on your business and not, you know, whether you have liability insurance, whether your formation is up to date. I mean, I don't know if people know, but you have to, you have to, to uh, file with most states. You have to file on an annual basis. Otherwise, yeah. your your uh, your formation will be in bad standing, and it's no longer in place. And it's there as a corporate shield to protect you and your family. And it's a great vehicle. Uh, you know, I think it, it stimulates uh, the economy, and it has for you know hundred plus years. So it's, it's a good thing. And, uh, there's no excuse to not take that first step, jump into action when we do it for free. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's an awesome service because there's so many, uh, especially now that we have online entrepreneurship growing and growing and growing people can, you know, they may be in their home in Chicago or, you know, Phoenix or wherever in the world starting their new business and realize they need to incorporate where it, I can tell you firsthand because I did it. It was a major task to start my first LLC. It was a lot of work. It was a pain in the ass and it was um, things I didn't want to take time away from my regular business, just figuring out what to do, where to go, who to pay and then register and then, you know, uh, you know, keep everything updated and have a service like that. I think it's really a, a great right. idea. I know, I know you guys have a goal of hitting, uh, helping a million entrepreneurs in five years. How, how have you guys, how have you been doing with that goal? We're, we're doing great. Good. We are, we're, we're on track. We're doing a, a fabulous job at that. We're getting great feedback and, um, you know, trying to be very responsive to our customers and give them what, give them what they're, they're asking for. So it's been it, so, so far so good. I think uh, we're really tapped into something here. No one wants to, deal with this and then let me ask you this Chris did you get the late notices from the state the scary letters like hey <laughs> you know you need to file your franchise tax or your annual filing uh, I, I didn't but I don't uh, check my mail on a regular basis because I'm usually abroad so <laughs> I'm sure it's somewhere <laughs> so, so I had in the past and so we just we remove all of that hassle uh, yeah and uh, you know recently I just had to do some uh, oh, my accountant was uh, asking for um, my uh, EIN number, 
yeah. to, for my bank account. Uh, and, um, you know, my formation documents, well, I could just go to my digital dashboard and directly email them to him. Oh, nice. You yeah. know, so just this, this super convenient having everything integrated. So we think there's a great opportunity here and we think it's great for the customer, which is what we're very focused on is, you know, I have a belief coming from all the consumer businesses that, that I have is, you know, you treat your customer right, you give them a great product and service, uh, and, uh, you know, then when you come to sell them other products, they don't have to think, geez, I had a bad experience. Why would I buy anything else from you? Opposed, they think of, man, I had a great experience. These guys know what they're doing. Of course, I need this product. I'm going to buy it. So I think that, you know, that's really the way you build a, a good business. And it's the way you add value to the world, which is really what we're focused on is uh, being able to tap into this trend, Chris, that's, you know, I think you're part of is, you know, more and more people are, you know, uh, independent agents in their career. You know, they, they, they no longer work for the, the big company because those, those jobs no longer exist. They're yeah. more of what, what I call the Hollywood model. If you, if you go out to California, everybody's an independent contractor and everybody has their own brand. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a, it's been a great model for the, the movie studios. I think it's, you know, worked for, uh, you know, a lot of these independent contractors. And I think the world is for better or worse is transitioning into, you know, that. And there's that studies, recent studies out there that, that show, you know, the gig economy is growing. Well, every one of those people that's in the gig economy needs an LLC, just like the big businesses have to protect their assets. It's very true. Ross, one quick question. We'll get you out of here. Um, being Having the career that you did, working with HomeAway and Excite and uh, now is in business, you've gained a, a certain amount of influence. And we see influencers, influencers out there today. Um, and some of them gain influence without going through the cycles of, of understanding business, becoming an entrepreneur, and they'll, they'll use that influence sometimes accidentally and sometimes not to have a, a negative repercussions. I, I just want to know, like, how do you, uh, how do you manage the influence that you have and then make sure that you're using that for good? Yeah, I think, uh, I always... When someone reaches out to me, I'm involved with uh, one of the founders at Capital Factory here and early investors and a mentor and, and I've been an angel investor. I'm also um, on the board of a, a place called the Santa Fe Institute, which I think is, uh, well, I know is an institute, I think the top top 10 think tanks in the, on the globe, solving global issues, energy, population growth, scaling cities, uh, you know, how are we going to feed everybody, uh, uh, clean water. So I think, you know, I, I spend my time there and my, my money on, at the Santa Fe Institute trying to, to make the world better. And on the individual level, Chris, I always, when I see the email from, you know, such and such two people removed, you know, I don't blow them off. I say, I look at the email, I'll sit back and say, hey, listen, here's when I have office hours or, you know, if I can't help them, I try to vector them to, to someone I can help because I think, you know, there's nothing worse than running into some influencer that's an asshole. And so, <laughs> so we, we have a, 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 a saying here at Zen Business is, you know, we don't hire assholes, so there. We used to have our Wi-Fi password. I'll tell you, it's changed now. It used to be no assholes. Uh, we've since changed it um, uh, uh, to something more secure. But I think, <laughs> you know, you've got to reach out. I mean, and you know what's funny, Chris, is I'd say nine times out of ten that um, you know I, I have a. They, I always get something of equal value back from that interaction, you know, whether it's good karma or wow, this young kid's got some new technology and uh, maybe we need to start looking at that technology or, 
it's just, I think it's, it's important to, you know, I feel better about giving than taking. And so I guess my influence is, is, has been that. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, blindly go for every meeting. I do some vetting, but uh, you don't really have to work very hard to get a meeting with me. That makes sense. I, I do appreciate like that mentality. I know some other major influencers that have that as well, because I think we all um, can understand what it's like to be a young entrepreneur or journalist or anything and just want to get in touch with the higher level people out there. And, and when they do, it's a big, it makes a big difference for them. I know it's happened to me when one of my biggest interviews was uh, uh, Tim Sanders, the former executive of Yahoo. And I was just doing backflips about it, you know, and, and I appreciate you guys willing to let us uh, have your time and, and give back to us. It's really um, motivates the younger entrepreneurial generation, I think. Um, Ross, I know you got to go. We're going to wrap up there. Uh, if the listeners want to reach out and learn more about you or Zen Business, where's the best place they can do that at? Well, they can go to uh, zenbusiness.com and you just uh, learn about the business. And then they can get a hold of me at ross at zenbusiness.com, R O S S. Perfect. And thank you again, Ross, so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll wrap up the show there. Listeners, thank you guys for tuning in once again. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks so much, Chris. Bye-bye. Hey, listeners. Thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.